My intention this week is to do a little bit more than just run over the, uh, the textbook saying what this guy, what this guy said and things uh, else. I want to do some some actual philosophy in the class. I want to. Um, So this is sort of a model of how philosophy works, or is supposed to work. Um, okay. There's a sort of cycle, uh, they call a um, dialectical process. Someone comes up with an idea. Well, oh, that's the last one. Someone has an idea. Uh, in this case, we have Plato having um, the idea of knowledge is justified through belief. So, the idea. broken down, I think, into, into three parts. <coughs> First, the critic represents the original idea. He says, okay, and we've got, um, going to talk over each other. I, I think that that's, this is bad because it encourages
I thought it was for debate. Debate! <laughs> or for the wrangles. That's what it's called. Okay. Uh, Plato is saying, Thomas says that Plato is saying that you should give the Logos. That you only have, you only have uh, knowledge if you have a justified, uh, sorry, where am I going? How many of you noticed the mistake? Okay. It was not deliberate. This is what we in the business call a stupid mistake. Right. You have a belief, that belief is true, and you can give the Logos for the belief. So Palmer says, Plato says that. So, you represent the original idea. Um, Then you point out some feature of that representation. philosophers can be a mobile. It's the Greek plural focus. Only philosophers can do this. So, in Palmer's model of Plato's view, only the rich people, uh, Palmer's model of Plato's view, uh, justification means give the logos, and what we know about giving the logos <coughs> is that it involves complicated reasoning, and only rich people have the leisure time to do that. Only uh, philosophers have the expertise of the, the knowledge of this stuff. Then you say why the feature is bad. The critic says the feature is bad. Palmer says. That's elitist. Well, we could consider Plato an elitist because he has a theory. He has a theory that, uh, uh, that is such that only certain people can have knowledge. Knowledge is something restricted to a very small group. And now the third part of this Someone defends the idea. Um, which case would be me? I'm going to defend the idea. Today I'm going to defend Plato's idea against Palmer's criticism.
people think about it. Now, this process can have a short lead time. We have, um, well, um, one of the things that happened when Einstein advanced his theory of relativity was a bunch of philosophers all wrote papers saying that Einstein had to be wrong. And then Einstein wrote a series of papers in which he pointed out that he hadn't said what these people said he said. What happened was Einstein came up with uh, special then general relativity. Um, he published it. A bunch of people read it and didn't understand it. A bunch of philosophers read it and didn't understand it. And they thought Einstein was saying something that was very different from what he was actually saying. So Einstein's job to defend his theory was to correct these misunderstandings. He didn't have to come up with new arguments for his theory. What he had to do was say, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying this other thing. Have you ever been in that position? You're saying something to someone, and they start arguing with you, but their argument has nothing to do with what you said. They took what you said, the other person took what you said, changed it, and then started arguing against the changed thing. No one's ever had that happen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That happens to me a lot. I don't know why. Because I'm always so clear. So, so someone defends the idea. Maybe the original guy. Today, I'm going to defend Plato. So this is like a couple thousand years later. But this is a, the elitism, that I think, is a modern criticism. In fact, I've never seen it outside the past book. Um, someone defends the idea. And the last part of philosophy is that um, People look at this whole thing, they look at the original idea, ask the person who wrote it, they look at the criticism, they look at the defense, and they say to themselves, well, is this working? What do I think about this? So that, that's your part. For the test, I'm going to want you to know something about this process. I want you to know Plato's view, I want you to know Palmer's view of Plato, and I want you to know my defense. Okay. Any questions about this process? Those of you who have uh, taken science classes should be familiar with this kind of process because it's basically how science works too. People have ideas, they defend them, they argue for them, other people criticize them. Every part of science is supposed to be continuously in contention. Well, not every part, but just that sort of all the time. So, last week we talked about Plato's view of knowledge as justified true belief or a true belief where the holder of the belief can give the logos. So, and I want to emphasize something about the logical structure of the elitism criticism. Here's Donald Palmer, the author of my book, happy man. And he's saying something about Plato. Okay, Plato is bold and has a big curly beard because that's easy to draw. Also, he's fat. That way I can write his name on his t-shirt.
So here in black is what Palmer says Plato is saying. And then in red, we have up more stuff from Palmer. includes the ability to give the logos. And here's the example. coat. Mr. Ed is quadruped. Mr. Ed is, uh, has hooves that are not divided. Uh, Mr. Ed has a certain shape of head. Mr. Ed has certain features that um, if we know the differences between horses and donkeys and mules and jennies, then uh, we would say Mr. Ed's a horse. Uh, now, According to Donald Palmer, Plato would say we don't know it's a horse. How many chromosomes pairs does Mr. Ed have? If you read the book, anyway, um, I don't know how many pairs, I forgot. I think it's 32. I only read that in the book. Now, According to Palmer, Plato's theory P.O.P. Train of thought for Palmer on Plato. This isn't just Plato, this is Palmer's view of Plato. And this is one thing you must, one of the things that you really must know, really must internalize, and they were being able to do philosophy, or being able to do any intellectual activity, is that just because somebody tells you that somebody else has a certain idea, doesn't mean that that other person has the idea. The only person who can tell you 
what his or her ideas are is the person themselves. So if somebody tells you, I think something, the way to find out if that's true or not is to ask me. If somebody tells you I believe something, that I don't tell you I believe it, then I don't believe it. Um, a lot of people running around saying that Al Gore claimed to have invented the internet. Any trouble is, Al Gore never said that. Other people say it about him. But he himself does not have that belief. We do not get to tell other people what they think or what they believe. Have you ever had someone try to tell you what you believe? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is me off. I didn't say the way I used it. No, I didn't. Don't think that. I didn't say it. So, so this is the view Palmer's, Palmer on Plato, playing POP. Plato's theory is elitist. According to Palmer, Plato's theory says that you can't know that a horse is that Mr. Ed is a horse. Well, you can because you read in Palmer's book that horses have played a good chromosomes. But do you know how many stomachs a horse has? No. Really? Um, I don't. Okay, I, I believe you. Um, do you remember? Do you know which variant? of cytochrome C it has. Do you know the structure of the horse's variant of hemoglobin? The, 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 some, the blood stuff. Um, do you know what diseases affect horses but not humans? Do you know the horse's evolutionary history? Do you know the relationship between horses and jennies? Do you know, here know what a jenny is? It's the, it's the inverse of a mule. I think you have a male horse and female donkey will produce a mule, a male donkey and a female horse will produce a jenny. I know sharks can have cancer. Yeah, but they don't work. They're, they're sterile, like mules. So, so you have to know esoteric stuff about horses to know this to add some force. So Plato's theory is elitist. Um, many, many, many societies in this world have been elitist. Uh, my favorite example, because it is actually bizarre, is the old Soviet Union. Does anyone here know the word nomenklatura? The nomenklatura? Um, this allegedly classless Soviet society actually had a special class called the nomenclatura, which was composed largely of family members of high party officials. And these people got special shops and special privileges. Um, if you dress nicely enough, you can get into any store on Rodeo Drive. If you have enough money, you can buy things in the stores on Rodeo Drive. This was not true in the old Soviet Union. You had, there were special stores where only the nomenclatura could shop. If you were an ordinary Russian, no matter how nicely you dressed or how much money you brought to the, to the door, they wouldn't let you in. That's elitism. 
That's saying that some people are better than others. You know, aristocratic systems were elitist. If you were an aristocrat, you could get uh, preference. If you weren't an aristocrat, you'd be stuck. Uh, systems of racism uh, are elitist. Uh, it's a very pernicious form of elitism. So to say that something is elitist is to make a serious moral charge. So I want to ask two questions about Plato's theory. has defined knowledge in, in such a way that if you follow through his definition, you find out that as a practical matter, only those people who are lucky enough to have the leisure time to study philosophy will ever know it. Would that really make Plato's theory elitist? Does it say, does his theory say only children of rich Greeks can have knowledge, or only Greeks can have knowledge, or only the children of philosophers can have knowledge. It says anybody who had the leisure time and the intelligence <coughs> to study and understand this stuff could have knowledge. Is that elitist? No, it's not. Think about the National Basketball Association. Could I ever get to play professional basketball? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Not impossible. Well, technically it's not impossible, but as a practical matter, first, I don't have the leisure time to practice. Second, I'm short. Third, um, I have all the grace and dexterity of a baby elephant on preludes. Um, basically, any professional basketball uh, team that paid, mon paid m me money would be throwing it down the drain. Any professional basketball team that put me on the, on the court would be pretty much deliberately losing. Maybe you could create the other team. What? Maybe you can berate the other team. I can berate the other team. I'm good at that, but I don't think they listen. I mean, they're all cold, so I'm going to talk. So, I'll ask you six foot. So, that's all. What, what? I'm five six. He's <laughs> tall. I'm short. I looked it up. I'm officially short. I don't feel short. So, uh, is the National Basketball Association an elitist organization? No. No. They take whoever can do the job. So it's not elitist. Plato's theory is not, uh, is not um, socially elitist. Plato, Plato personally is probably an elitist, he's probably a racist, he's probably an, uh, an aristocrat, and all this kind of stuff. But, if you read The Republic, it's pretty scary. But this is not elitist in that sense. The second is, is Plato's theory really, does Plato's theories really say that you have to know all this esoteric knowledge in order to know that Mr. Ed is a horse? The answer is, I believe, no. First, let me give you something called the principle of charity.
this is just plain charity. If I am representing somebody's view in a way that makes that view out to be stupid, when I could equally well represent it in a way that makes it smart, I should choose the smart way. You don't have the right to distort people's views to make them out to be stupid. If we have a choice in how we interpret someone's view, we should always take the most <coughs> sensible version. A lot of reasons for that. And one is, uh, anything else is dishonest. Or at least mean. So, we can interpret Plato as referring to differentia, visible signs by which we distinguish objects from each other. Suppose we are arguing, uh, arguing about whether this is a horse or a zebra, and I'm insisting it's a zebra. If you point out that it has no stripes, then you're pointing at a, at a, at a differentia, at a thing that makes horses different from zebras. To have a just not, to have a justified belief that this is a horse. All we have to do is run through all the things that differentiate horses from other animals. From zebras, donkeys, um, antelopes, you know, no horns. Once you've eliminated everything else that it could be, the one remaining thing that it could be is what it is. And I am personally convinced that that's what Plato was talking about. <coughs> he wasn't talking about being able to give a chromosome count. And I, I think it's a very telling, it's very, it, it just sort of sticks in my head that Donald Palmer uses chromosome counts in this example. Why? Well, there's two things. First, to make this example, Palmer has to come up with something a philosopher would know about horses that a farmer wouldn't. But would a philosopher in Plato's day have known how many chromosomes a horse has? Would a guy in Plato, would Plato have known? No. No, he could not possibly have known. The knowledge is less than 100 years old. So, why couldn't Donald Palmer have come up with something that would make sense in that context? And my answer is there wasn't anything. I thought he tried to link that to Socrates' idea of you don't know everything, you don't know anything. Right, but who's going to know that kind of information? The philosopher or the guy who works with horses every day? Who's going to know how horses are related to mules? Who's going to know how, uh, how horses um, survive in the wild? Who's going to know how horses can be trained? Who's going to know exactly how smart horses are versus other animals? Who's going to know whether what, what kind of treatment will kill a horse? The thumb, everything you can say about horses that counts as real knowledge about horses <coughs> for that time, in fact, Platonic, a so Socratic knowledge about horses, the farmer's going to know. And the philosopher isn't, because the philosopher is a rich guy who has other, other people to do that stuff for him. If the philosopher owns horses and he rides horses, he's got stable boys. He's got guys who, who grooms who take care of the horses. So, Esoterica doesn't differentiate. 
let's say we are arguing about well, let's say an animal wanders in here off the street, and instead of chewing it out, uh, we, we argue over what kind of animal it is. So a, long, a few years ago, I was in my backyard working on something, and a pit bull wandered into my backyard. A pit bull. Yes, yeah, a dog. It's a big, tough dog. And and of course I said, hello. Now at the time, I thought it was a pit bull belonging to some friends of ours who I knew had a pit bull. I didn't know them very well, but I knew they had a pit bull. I thought, oh, okay, these people are, are just going to Malia and Amal stood up, they brought the dog and the dog's wandering around. <coughs> no, no, our friends, but this was a completely random pit bull. It had just been wandering around the street, came in, walked into my backyard, looked up at me, like, hello, hello. So I, we chatted for a while. Well, I, I, I chatted. The pit bull. Pit bulls, by the way, are wonderful animals. Properly raised pit bull is one of the sweetest dogs you could ever know. So, then suppose a pit bull wanders in here and we start, or so there's a random dog wanders in here and we start arguing about what kind of dog it is. Um, are we going to talk about chromosome counts? Suppose we have this horse-like, muley, donkey-like quadruped comes in and we're trying to tell whether it's a horse or a mule or whatever, uh, Pegasus, no, it's not Pegasus, no wings, right? How many of us are going to say, look at the damn thing, look, how many chromosomes do you see? How many chromosomes do you see here? You know, look closely. Count the chromosomes. Obviously it's a horse. How could knowing a chromosome count help you tell whether or not this is a horse? We don't have the equipment on hand to count its chromosomes. We never do. Knowing esoteric lot of knowledge about stuff, about things, does not help you understand, uh, does not help you differentiate between horses and other animals. It doesn't tell you whether or not this bread is a horse. The kind of knowledge that helps you is the kind of knowledge the farmer has. So, um, <coughs> Plato would have to be insane to have to, to, to have this as part of his definition of knowledge. It's not practical. So by pointing to visible signs by which we distinguish objects from each other. Uh, by sensible, I mean something that actually works out logically then we should do that. So,
to know that something is a horse, for the farmer to know that this is a horse, Plato says all he has to do is give the differentiator. Young says that Plato says that knowledge is just a kind of belief. Justification is just understood as being able to justify your belief. So in order to know that that's a TV set, put it this way. If we took Palmer's version of Plato, could we ever know ever anything? Okay. What is that object? Something. No, it's a TV. Thank you. Yes. How many of you know uh, how TVs work? Uh, how many of you know why? Why they called cathode ray tubes? <coughs> so a cathode ray tube. I just uh, learned about it last summer. It's uh, this a lot of electromagnetic doohickeys and stuff. Um, you know, but I only have the simplest version of it. You ask me how the beam is controlled. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know a tiny little bit about TVs. So, if Palmer is right about Plato, Plato's theory says basically none of us can know anything, or very, very few people can know anything, because we can't give you the entire theory of electromagnetism and electrical fields, stuff like that. Now, my personal suspicion is that Palmer has gotten confused. Knowing, in Plato's theory, knowing that's a TV or knowing Mr. Ed is a horse, what kind of knowledge is that? Is that a good knowledge or is that crappy knowledge? Yeah, it's crappy. You know, um, you know, you know, if you've got an actual horse and you know it's a horse, you know something, you know something better than knowing a picture of a horse or a horse's shadow. But that, I mean, that's not any scientific laws, is it? The farmer doesn't know scientific laws. The farmer knows that this is a horse, but he doesn't know the scientific laws underlying horses, and he doesn't know the forms. For Plato, the only kind of knowledge that's really worth having, the most important kind of knowledge, is knowledge gained by contemplation, which is knowledge of the forms, knowledge of the God, good. The kind of knowledge you could only get by sitting down and listening to Plato, <coughs> following through his arguments. So who has time to do that? Almost nobody. Still not elitist in the sense that it is something that's only available to the economic elite because only the elite can do it. It's rather like polo. Polo is an incredibly expensive sport. No, we're like thinking of ball. Yeah, you got a, no, that's croquet. No, not croquet. Uh, polo, you have a long stick and you ride a horse. Right. 
And you look really stupid in those hats. <coughs> Prince Charles was um, So you could say, well, knowledge is only available to the elite. Unesoteric knowledge <coughs> is available to the elite. Plato values that most. But you know, how is that different from today? How many of us have the leisure time, the financial and the, and the resources to say, get a PhD in theoretical physics, to do theoretical physics? It's only a very, very tiny people. But that doesn't mean it's elitist. Not in that value system. Okay. Well, what I'm going to leave you with today is something I want you to think about. Is everyone getting this? I'm talking about Palmer's view of Plato. When you see a doctrine criticized, you always know you're getting some guy's view of some other guy's view. You're getting a view of a view. And there's always two questions. Did they, do, did they get the view right? And if they did, is it really a problem? This thing in parenthesis, Young says, you can mentally fill this in for anything I say about anything. Whenever I tell you anything, it's my opinion. This is true of all your professors. When a professor tells you, tells you something, he's giving you your he's giving you his opinion of that thing. And you're always entitled to think. Is he getting this right? Is she getting this right? Sometimes we get it wrong. So this is something to fill in. I'm not going to explicitly put that up the rest of the semester, but it's an interval moment. So Young says, or Plato says, Here's my criticism of Plato. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't invent this. Uh, this is actually a common criticism of Plato. I don't know why it's not in the book. Uh, but I'm going to give you my formulation on it. And of course, I could be getting Plato wrong. And even if I'm getting Plato wrong, or even if I'm getting Plato right, the criticism could be misguided. The same rules apply to me as apply to Palmer.
trying to justify a claim of knowledge. something you just have to say, I believe it, yeah, it's a horse. If it's a reason that somebody else would give, that goes in here, because it's part of the justification process. What goes in the truth bucket? Okay, tell me something. Those are justifications. Go to justification. You say, but it's true. Proof that it's true. We're trying to justify a knowledge claim. Right. You look at it, you see, you see these things, right? Be specific. You see these things, they go into the justification bucket. What's going on is Plato says knowledge is justified true belief. One, two, three. Belief has Right. 
can Plato's theory be right? Yeah, if Plato's theory, the theory is right, then when we justify a knowledge claim, we will have something to put in the truth bucket. What do we put in the truth bucket? Goes into the justification bucket. But wouldn't the fact that everybody believes the same thing wouldn't that like be the earth being flat? Yeah, but that not, I mean, like not everybody flat, believes the existence it. of various supernatural beings. Well, or we know it is true of the world. Well, we don't. We're trying to justify a knowledge plan. We're trying but to for the time that we know that the majority kind of rule. Right. No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, that's one of the first things you learn in philosophy. So it doesn't work then. Exactly. But we'll talk about that uh, on Wednesday. <laughs>